Have you ever thought to yourself, I love LEGO, but I wish it was just a little bit more dangerous? Well then maybe this is the weekend project for you. This is a baby LEGO Tesla coil, which is also known as a Slayer Exciter. And this is the Slayer wirelessly powering a couple of fluorescent bulbs. Who would have thought you can use LEGO to wirelessly transmit power? Well I guess it's mostly the circuit responsible for that, but let's give LEGO some credit for this video. It sure does make a great scaffold for experiments like this. In this video, I'll show you how you can make your own LEGO Slayer, and then we'll see later in the video what exactly it can do. Now some folks may argue this isn't a true Tesla coil, and they have a point, but also in a sense this absolutely is a Tesla coil at heart. I won't delve too deeply into how Tesla coils work in this video, as there are many other videos out there that can explain this better than me, but in essence you can consider this Slayer a type of self-oscillating solid-state Tesla coil. It just doesn't belch out these massive arcs that a good Tesla coil can. This coil, on the other hand, is relatively safe, and if you use my design here, it shouldn't shock you, though you should probably still avoid touching the business end of it to avoid minor tickles and burns. Now this is an extremely simple high voltage circuit, and you can build your own with very minimal understanding of electronics. Unfortunately, this is a particularly forgiving circuit, so even if you don't follow my exact setup, yours will likely still work. For instance, the coils can be made of various different shapes, wire diameters, and numbers of loops, and the transistor can be any of a variety of NPN transistors, and you can also use a variety of resistors and capacitors, they should work fine. Alright, let's get started! Okay, let's get to building. Let's start with the secondary coil. If you have some of these round pieces, these will work best to support the structure of the tower. I stacked around 20 of these on top of each other to build the tower, and this should provide a perfect shape and the axle central hole will make it easy to mount onto a base later. Then comes the fun part, spending an hour or two gradually developing finger and neck aches. And if you're anything like me, possibly cramping your big toe as well. To begin winding the wire, you have to anchor the wire to something. I usually just stick a connector in somewhere and wrap around 10 centimeters of wire around it, securing it with blue tack. Then you start winding, and boy is this not fun. Ideally you want your coil to be as perfect as possible. This means no gaps and no overlaps. Each wire should be tight and firmly secured against its neighbour. One way you can do this is by putting the wire spool in a smooth bowl like this, and using one hand to hold the wire tight while winding with the other hand. If you need to pause, you can stick a blob of blue tack onto it and hold it in place like this. But there is a better way! Why use only two appendages when you have four? I like to stick a chopstick through the spool and hold it with my feet like this. Now it never gets tangled, and your effort will be rewarded with cold feet and mild toe cramps. But in the end, now we're left with a beautiful secondary coil. My tower is about 20 centimeters long, and the wire portion is around 16 centimeters long. So because I'm using 30 gauge wire, it has around 600 loops. The stray end at the top can be secured using blue tack or insulation tape, but I'm going to use tape as I don't really intend to take this coil apart anytime soon. Then, after spending several hours giving your coil your undivided love and attention, what you can do is break it, because you're a clumsy idiot. <sighs> Rest in peace, little tower. Okay, so back to the drawing board. Well this is LEGO, why not use a little ingenuity to make something else do the work for you? Something that's a little bit more coordinated than my clumsy fingers. So here we go, it's basic but it'll have to do. The motors wind the tower, and all I have to do is guide the wire to make sure the windings are tight. Speaking of tight, to make sure the tower doesn't snap in the middle again, I've stuck a long Technic axle through the middle of it. It doesn't quite reach all the way through the tower, but it's long enough that the tower shouldn't break in the middle again. Let's just hope the ends play nice. It's a little finicky getting the wires to line up nicely, and in fact, after a few minutes I just gave up and removed the motor, and resorted to hand winding the spool using my new winding station. This worked much better. Okay, we're done. Let's tape up the ends again with insulation tape. So I scraped the ends with a metal nail file to expose the copper, and the free end at the top doesn't really need to be connected to anything, but many folks attach a small top load to act as a capacitor, to store some of the charge, and to increase the size of the excited field around it. 
You gotta be careful not to make the top load too large though, or it might actually reduce the size of the field around it. Personally, I don't tend to use a top load too often, as usually the towers work good enough by themselves. But in this case, I did end up making a top load to try and spread out the field a little better, and in fact that did work in the end. I'll show a comparison a little bit later. To make my top load, I took one of these round Lego plates and covered it in copper tape. And then you can secure the wire on top using blue tack. I had some copper tape travel under the lip as well, so I could secure it to the wire with blue tack and keep it hidden. At this point, some of you might be thinking, damn, this looks like a pain, and I don't have these round pieces to make the tower. Well, yeah, it is gonna be a bit of a pain. Uh, I can't really help you there. But don't fret if you don't have these specialized round pieces. This is Lego, so we can always improvise. And fortunately, as I mentioned earlier, this circuit is quite forgiving, so you can use a wide variety of shapes and sizes for your coil. For instance, this circuit scales down quite well. You can even use these small connector pieces here to build a tiny tower. And here's one I made earlier. It's not quite as powerful, but it does actually work. I'll show it in action a little later in the video. Now, probably the easiest way to build a tower that still functions well is by building it in a square shape. I used some lift arms arranged like this, but you can use anything that is square or even rectangular, so long as the surface is smooth enough to wrap the wire around it. You won't get the wires quite as perfect, but as long as there are no overlaps or gaps, it should still work relatively well. I'll show this tower in action near the end of the video. Now let's take a brief look at the circuit itself. It's very simple in principle, and actually quite forgiving in terms of what components you use. As I said earlier, I'm using a breadboard, or you can skip this if you solder the components directly to each other, an NPN22222 transistor, these are very common transistors, you can find them very cheaply online, some resistors that in series add up to around 22 kilo ohms, though you can use any series of resistors that add up to around 20 to 40 kilo ohms, an LED, but you can use really any fast switching diode. LEDs are good though because they provide a visual indication as to whether your circuit is working or not. You'll need some wires to make connections, and I'm using a 16 volt 100 microfarad electrolytic smoothing capacitor to smooth the input voltage. Now to note here, many slayers actually don't use a capacitor here, but for some reason mine just haven't really worked without one. Maybe it's my transistors being finicky. I've used a wide variety of capacitors here, and most of them work fine, so this is very forgiving. So you should be fine to experiment here, so long as the rated voltage is larger than your input voltage. Okay, for those of you who just want to copy this, here's the circuit diagram, feel free to pause if you need to. And here's a zoomed in picture of my breadboard circuit in case you just want to copy it directly. Okay, let's put it all together. Let's start with the Lego structure. I've used two large Lego plates to act as the base and to house the circuitry. And here, I've built a switch out of Lego. When I press the button down, these two copper pads make contact, closing the circuit. An electric band then pulls the switch into the open position, which is the default state. So to use this layer, you've got to press and hold. You really don't need to build a switch, but I just wanted to make this out of as much Lego as possible. For the primary coil, I've mounted these four L-shaped lift arms onto the roof, and these will serve as the mount for our primary coil. I'm using 12 gauge silicon coated wire, this copper is around 2 mm thick, which I'll feed through the lift arm holes like this. This ultimately gives us around 4 loops, and the ends are connected to the primary coil connections on the breadboard, which are green in my board. I'll hook those up in just a moment. To stop the internal components moving around, I'm going to constrain them between these base plates using these lift arms. Fortunately, the dimensions seem to fit LEGO quite nicely, and now we can pop in the breadboard and battery, and they'll hold in place nicely. So now that things are secure, I can hook up the switch and battery connections to the board over here. I'll attach one lead of the battery to the board, and the other one to one of these switch plates. Then the other end of the switch plate will go to the board. When we press the button down, closing the loop, power will travel from the battery to the board. Next up are the connections to the primary coil. These are the two green wires on my board. My advice here is to not bother trying to figure out the orientation, just stick the primary coil ends into the green wires. I'm using some simple wire connectors, which are the white things here, to make it easier to swap them if I need to. If you don't have wire connectors, you can twist them together, solder them, or really use any other means of connecting them up. 
If the coil doesn't work immediately when you turn it on, try reversing these connections. Now that we've got all the main components made, we can pop the roof on. This was a little tricky with all the wires, but after a little wiggling, it eventually fits snugly. And then finally, we can pop on our secondary coil. The bottom wire of the coil is connected to the breadboard here, to the secondary wire input, which in my case, this is the blue wire. Great, we're all done! Let's give it a quick test. When I press and hold the button, and I bring this fluorescent light near it, it lights up! So what exactly is going on here? Like I said, I'm not going to give a history lesson on how Tesla coils or Slayers work here, but to give a very brief explanation for what's happening, this Slayer circuit is essentially a resonant circuit that boosts voltage massively, though current is obviously very low. Ow. The voltage boost is caused by the primary coil dumping its energy into the secondary coil many times per second, and this is controlled by the transistor oscillating. In fact, it is precisely the feedback from the secondary coil that causes the transistor to turn on and off. This is what makes the circuit self-oscillating. Because the winding ratio of the primary coil to the secondary coil is so large, several hundred times to one, this effectively boosts the voltage by that ratio. My secondary coil here has approximately 600 turns, and the primary coil has 4 turns, so I'd expect the voltage in the circuit to be boosted by somewhere around 150 times. So because we're using a 9 volt battery, I'd imagine the voltage is reaching eh, somewhere just north of around 1000 volts. Now this might sound quite high, and it is, but because the resonance is very fast, faster than our neurons can detect, we shouldn't feel a shock from it. Though a word of caution, you might burn your skin a little if you handle the output wire at the top of the coil. I've handled the output wire a few times and experienced a minor pinch, which is not bad or too dangerous, but I would still recommend avoiding the coil while it's in use. So I'll touch briefly on tuning here in case your slayers aren't performing too well. In general, there are a few key ways in which we can tune our slayers. We can change the windings and length of the secondary coil. We can change the top load of the secondary coil. We can change the number of windings on the primary coil. We can change the position of the primary coil, meaning both height and distance from the coil. And we can change the distance between the loops in the primary coil. By playing with these variables, we can squeeze out a little more performance and stability from the Slayer. I found that sometimes if these variables aren't optimal, the Slayer will stutter and the field it generates will be weaker. This is generally visualized by using a fluorescent tube. The better the performance, the more stable the light will be, and you'll be able to see it glow from a further distance away from the coil. It'll also glow brighter. Probably the easiest way to tune your circuits is to play mostly with the primary coil windings. It's really not that easy to mess around with the secondary coil once it's built. So try changing the number of windings in your primary, the height of it, and the distance between each winding. And then lastly, I would also recommend playing around with the top load of the secondary coil. I just use copper tape, but you can use things like aluminium foil, and you can play around with making it bigger, smaller, flatter, rounder, whatever. Okay, so now that we've built this thing, what does it actually do? Well, one of the more visually striking things is the wireless transmission of power. This won't come as a surprise to anyone who's come across these videos on Slayers or Tesla coils, but the strong electromagnetic field emitted by these Slayers can excite the gas in fluorescent tubes or really in fact any noble gases stored in low pressure tubes. This here is a standard 10 watt fluorescent tube, and if I bring it near the coil, the gas becomes excited and it begins to glow brightly. I just find it so cool that you can create a field strong enough to produce wireless light. For this circuit, it does tend to need the help of a human hand to act as a conductor to ground though. If you just prop up the light without any means for the field to get to ground, it often just won't light up unless you're using a much more powerful transistor. This one then is a 35 watt bulb, and it seems to get a very nice bright glow if you can find the right spot around the coil. Let's also try a 50 watt bulb. Again, this one seems to glow quite brightly if you can find the right spot for it. You can also try to light multiple bulbs at once, 
but typically they won't glow as brightly as each one will parasitize the excited field from the other bulbs. So as you can see, gases can be excited by the Slayer. In fact, there are a great many gases that will respond like this. This here is a neon spectrum gas tube, and it's essentially just a low tube filled with neon gas. Now this gas also becomes excited by the field, and glows this lovely bright ready orange neon color when we bring it near the coil. I really just love the color of this one. Then these little guys are also neon filled bulbs. They too glow when brought near the coil. And these little ones were interesting in that they identified a minor issue with my coil. Without the top load, you can see that when I bring them further up the coil, there seems to be a place where the field is breaking down near the top. This is why a top load can help performance a lot. Once I added the top load, this spot just underneath the brim of the top load actually now performs the best. And this works similarly for my other fluorescent bulbs. The addition of the top load massively improved their brightness and stability, and I could bring them much further away from the coil and still have them brightly lit. Finally, I tested out one of these nifty little plasma plates. When turned on, it produces some cool plasma patterns underneath the glass. This one actually responds to sound, which is pretty cool. When I bring this plate near the bare wire of the secondary, my camera can finally see the glow of the small plasma arc coming out of the end of my coil. This is kind of cool because I just couldn't see it before. And if I increase the output capacitance just a little using a small piece of copper tape, we can even excite this plasma plate producing some really cool pink plasma streamers. And then lastly, to demonstrate how robust the circuit is and how well it scales down, let's see a couple of other variations in the secondary coil. Here's the one I made with a square-shaped coil. Now it looks a little messy, but it's exactly the same circuit as my round tower slayer. And as you can see here, it's perhaps not quite as strong, but it does still work reasonably well, especially considering it doesn't have as many wire turns. So if you don't have those round pieces to make a perfect coil, clearly a square shape works fine. And now, as an extreme example of scaling down, here's a coil I made using those small pin connectors. Once again, I have to bring the bulb a little closer to the coil, but it does still work. That's pretty amazing that something so small, and made out of mostly Lego, can produce wireless energy. Well, that was fun. While the Slayer is pretty tame, I personally enjoy the relative safety of it. But in one of my next videos, I'll describe how we can upgrade it to produce some much more impressive outputs. If you're interested in knowing how to turn your LEGO into these fun experiments, feel free to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.